Thank you very much. It's, it's really an honor to be here, even after a Steeler loss. Uh, um, I thought uh, I'd show you a little bit first about Pittsburgh. You know, uh, Pittsburgh's always had a bad rap. You know, we're this industrial city with coal dust in the atmosphere, and Pittsburgh really is a, is a beautiful place, and I think it's a real surprise. Uh, uh, this is the point in Pittsburgh. You can see here the, uh, the Allegheny River and the Monongahela River coming together to form the Ohio River. And, uh, and, and Pittsburgh also has been able to attract a lot of great fellows and trainees. And people always say, well, how do you do it? You know, and I think one of the things, uh, yeah, we have a lot of cool things going on, but we also have... Uh, a pretty nice place. And so if you're interested and you're a young trainee, uh, take a look at Pittsburgh because I think you'll really be surprised. And one of the uh, young investigators, Travis Jackson, uh, uh, contributed a great deal to what I'm going to present to you today, kind of a new vision on hypothermia to explain some of the the challenges with it that we've seen, and also some input from two other uh, uh, young investigators, Erica Fink, uh, one of our junior faculty has just gone on to become an associate professor, and Chris Horvat, another one of our fellows who is staying on Pittsburgh uh, as a young faculty member. So I'm trying to give you a feeling for that, and I can tell you personally that the view from this window is really pretty cool. Uh, right down, that is the origin of the Ohio River in Pittsburgh, and uh, it's really quite a, it's quite a special place. Uh, uh, and uh, that little mountain you see in the background is Mount Washington, and Peter Saffer said the 100 anesthesia faculty that he recruited to Pittsburgh around 1960, going from a department of three to 100 faculty, could never have been done without the view from Mount Washington. Oh. Uh, I do have a couple of disclosures. Uh, um, surprisingly, uh, we have a number of patents uh, or provisional patents, and one of them actually on some of the findings I'm going to talk about uh, in this talk, some very novel thinking on where hypothermia may be going, some actually drugs that we are thinking about and using uh, experimentally to try to mimic hypothermia. And uh, none of them are in any kind of clinical use, so I have no conflicts from that regard. But they are things that the university thought was clever enough uh, to actually patent. Hypothermia, when you think about where its origins are, there are many old slides, you know, that you see, uh, where did it start? And I, I came across this and I just said, wow, this is pretty wild, that Aristotle in the fourth century BC said that man's superior intelligence depends on the fact that his larger brain is capable of keeping the heart cool enough for mental activity. And so in my mind, you know, given that Aristotle professed that the heart was the center of nervous function, he recognized the importance of control of fever prevention in neurocritical care. He just had the organs mixed up. And, uh, and uh, so if you fast forward 2,100 years, this slide uh, or, or some analog of it has been shown very commonly. The early evidence for the importance of temperature regulation in shock trauma and resuscitation uh, Baron uh, uh, Dominique Jean Loret, Napoleon's uh, major surgeon uh, in the early 1800s, saying that the wounded soldiers located farthest from the campfire survived the longest. And uh, fast forwarding another 100 years, one of the most interesting finds, and uh, Bob Clark from our group found this uh, quote out of John Phelps, the trauma surgeon for the New York City Police Department, uh, a famous neurosurgeon in his treatise in 1897 wrote that the application of the ice cap was beneficial in traumatic brain injury and second in efficacy only to trephination. And obviously in 1897, they didn't have much. I guess you could argue we don't have that much still either. In animal models, uh, 
across the board, preclinical studies in neurocritical care with acute insults to the brain, you pick your insult, there is nothing that shows a more beneficial effect than hypothermia. And uh, there have been many arguments, well, you can get it on board really fast, you don't have all the other confounding drugs, you don't have secondary infections, you don't have the many things that get in the way of implementing this clinically, but it's a fact that since the classic paper out of the Miami group, Dalton Dietrich, uh, Myron Ginsburg, and Raul Busto in 1986, it has been impossible to publish a paper, a preclinical study of acute brain injury without monitoring and controlling either core or more optimally brain temperature, depending on the model. That is a fact. and. Uh, and uh, very clearly, there's, there's still a, a great deal of ability to manipulate outcome of preclinical models with temperature. But lately, I would say there's been a, a degree of global warming uh, uh, that's challenged the efficacy of hypothermia, and very appropriately so. And uh, uh, we saw this in the, the really important paper on targeted temperature management, and we're seeing this on a bunch of fronts now. Uh, you look back at the old Don Marion study in traumatic brain injury, and the control group was febrile uh, very commonly, and, and obviously getting rid of that potential detrimental effect of temperature uh, maybe has changed the playing field, and, uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So if you go back to 2002, uh, when the, around that time the key papers emerged, uh, the, the Hakka trial by Fritz Sturz and the group from Vienna and, uh, and, and, and for instance, Don Marion's paper uh, that I just mentioned and uh, a number of the other really key papers that came out. And you fast forward, and it's very painful to show this, uh, the, you can see from 2002 to 2013 now, in 2013, there are some winners and some losers, and you'd say, wow, uh, hypothermia has had more losers. Uh, well, targeted temperature management, just clamping the patient at 36 was as good as going a little colder. And, um, and we've, we've seen this, uh, is this true in both adults and children? We'll talk a little bit about this. And, and you would argue, I think, pretty strongly that in traumatic brain injury, the, the situation is even worse for hypothermia because the studies that have been published, the Hutchison study and the Peter Andrews study in adults, in both children and adults, have suggested some, I would say, clear liabilities from therapeutic hypothermia after traumatic brain injury. And in fact, if you look at both of these studies carefully, really trading hypothermia for more osmolar therapy turned out to be a bad trade. And, uh, and so I think that uh, if you look at it, you say, well, targeted temperature management. And uh, uh, also, you may or may not know, but I think it's important for the record, that it was Tim Buckman, actually, that coined the term targeted temperature management at an SCCM Congress uh, in Puerto Rico on, on hypothermia. And it really has stuck. And you see that while well, targeted temperature management may do, just clamping one degree uh, lower, may do some key things, prevent fever, limit hypermetabolism, but also at the same time avoid the complications of cooling and rewarming, of which there are, are some. But are the benefits of targeted temperature management really all that we can hope for from hypothermia in neurocritical care? And, um, I guess in my mind, having all the preclinical studies showing what they've shown, I sure hope that's not the case. If we now take another look at this and look at from a newborn situation, you see the situation is really, really different. And hypothermia for perinatal asphyxia has been extremely effective. And, you know, it's really ironic because when I was a resident, uh, I was, did neonatology in Luke Lux unit in San Diego, a really amazing place. And 
um, in that era, if you did not immediately rewarm an infant that was critical, particularly one that was asphyxiated, it was malpractice. You were, you were just chastised and uh, raked over the coals. And I find it very ironic that the place that hypothermia has shown its greatest benefit is in that group. And th this is not a minor uh, finding. You look at the meta-analyses for hypothermia in neonatal asphyxia in two-term new newborns, and it just blows you away. It's, it's death, uh, it's neurodevelopmental outcome, it's every study, basically, uh, outcome now out to six or seven years of age. Even structural preservation, when you look at imaging, you see neuroprotection from this strategy. And so, wow, uh, why? Why is it working in newborn asphyxia? I mean, working really well and not for us. I guess you could say, don't get old. Hypothermia will stop working and you might get a Lifetime Achievement Award, you know? <laughs> Recently, we had the Thapka trial, and yesterday we had the uh, uh, um, in-hospital, in the out-of-hospital Thapka trial. Uh, the New England Journal representation of it uh, suggested kind of another doom and gloom outlook. Uh, but I think uh, looking at this carefully, one might say, uh, well, it depends on the perspective. And let's take a little uh, closer look at this. You see it didn't show a difference in survival with good neurologic outcome at one year. But if you look carefully, well, at a p-value of 0.1 and an absolute risk ratio of about 8%. And um, you see that uh, same p-value for mortality and, boy, this was expecting a big effect, uh, looking for a 20% effect. And again, the, this is a very important, extremely well-conducted study. It was based on the neonatal trials, uh, the treatment effect, and uh, they estimated 276 would, patients would need to be randomized. But 20% in anything is a big effect. It's really asking for a lot. And out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, even in-hospital cardiac arrest, are big challenges. And you could see, uh, when you looked at that study, the pre-existing medical conditions in the patients, 51%. And so this is a very heterogeneous target. And uh, you can also see that they're predominantly asphyxial in nature. And that could be good or it could be bad, because in my mind, asphyxial insults produce more brain damage pound for pound than primary cardiac arrest, of course, uh, depending on the duration. But asphyxia seems to have this very special propensity for brain versus heart. And, uh, and also you can see bystander uh, the witness arrest was 38% and bystander CPR and 63%. So 20% is asking for an awful lot. And here was the one-year survival data. And uh, there's a little something there. Maybe kids are a little closer to infants than adults. And, uh, you know, many of the letters to the New England Journal and other editorials about this said, well, the power was really 42 percent, and uh, the ARDSnet trial had an 87 percent power, and they, they detected a 10 percent difference. And if you take those kind of numbers, how many patients would have really needed to be randomized? 636, and uh, it's asking for a lot also. Uh, Jean-Louis Vincent, in an editorial in Critical Care, said that the data suggests that we'd need to treat treat 12 patients to see one favorable outcome versus normothermia, and if this held up in a larger trial, uh, please use this on my child. Well, uh, again, though, that, that, that now is uh, in the face of yesterday's results presented by Frank Moeller, the in-hospital FAPCA trial in children, another beautiful, important study in our field, really didn't show any trends at all and uh, was stopped for futility. So uh, the question is, do we really understand these diseases well enough? And are we stuck with these small effects? Uh, if you look back at the adult targeted temperature management trial and think of it in another way, say we're going forward from this study and want to see a 2% difference, and that's what they, they found between the two groups, the number needed to treat is 50. 
And, uh, but this is the same effect that was shown for aspirin in myocardial infarction, for instance, and uh, transanemic acid in major trauma, both which are felt to be uh, highly effective treatments. So, you know, you start to ask the question, well, is this perspective? And, uh, uh, but you could also say, are we doomed? And uh, outside of neonatal resuscitation, uh, with at best these really little effects in neurocritical care, what about the big banana? Could we get something that really has a powerful effect? And maybe can we find a giant monster effect in something? And uh, you know, people say, get real, Kohanic, you're delusional, uh, you know, there's no way. And, uh, but then, uh, if you watch college football today, it's not so fast, my friend. Maybe there is something. And, wow, look in neurocritical care recently in the studies in stroke with uh, clot retrieval. And you look at some of the effects that are being reported in that, and there's 31% Im improvement in outcome, 24% improvement in outcome. So I, I would just say that the brain has a shot. It, it, you know, this is an example. Now, Peter Saffer used to always say, well, in stroke, why are people trying neuroprotective therapies? Half the time you don't reperfuse, it's plumbing. And in essence, he was right. But my point on this is more that if maybe with the right therapy and the right approach, there are some opportunities in neurocritical care to improve outcome. And so uh, I also think we have to look at some of the things that, exciting things in my mind that are happening in our field. Uh, we really are starting to look at these diseases in a much more sophisticated and necessary way. Uh, for instance, uh, the comparative effectiveness trials that are ongoing in both pediatric and adult traumatic brain injury. Boy, if you take a look, the, Mike Bell just closed the 1,000 uh, ADAPT trial. Uh, and uh, if you look at what he showed going into that trial, the heterogeneity of care, even though it was guidelines-based care, overwhelming. And uh, how do you show the benefit of a new therapy superimposed on that? And uh, I can tell you with the ADAPT trial having just closed that the heterogeneity is going to blow people's mind uh, in terms of what is going on in background care. So uh, that's one area, and I think they'll see the same thing on the adult side uh, with uh, Andrew Moss uh, Center TBI trial. Uh, we also have some exciting opportunities with adaptive trial design. Any of you who were at last year's meeting heard Derek Angus's opening plenary talk and it was spectacular about how we're thinking about comparing multiple therapies with smaller groups and, and playing the winner, in essence, uh, to, to get to an answer. And, and people like Hector Wong here in sepsis with his prognostic and predictive enrichment and many other people uh, trying to endotype or genotype. Um, I, I mentioned cardiac arrest. Uh, no one's really ever, we've had in-hospital versus out-of-hospital trials, but we've never really had an asphyxia versus cardiac origin trial in cardiac arrest. We really need to phenotype potentially. And finally, things like target engagement biomarkers. Is the therapy that we're using affecting the mechanism that we're targeting? And then the brain, it's hard to reach in there and, and find out whether it is without really advanced monitoring or maybe some kind of biomarker approach. And some of the approaches uh, uh, that, uh, that Kevin Wang uh, is introducing from the University of Florida, keep your eyes out because maybe we can get therapies that are affecting a specific mechanism that we can uh, sense and monitor in blood and say, yes, the dose we gave of this was right for the brain. Uh, and right now, we, we, we really haven't done that. So I think maybe we're expecting too much. Uh, let's get back to hypothermia. Uh, you know, we have this newborn conundrum. It, seemed to, it seems to work really well in uh, term newborns uh, with asphyxia. And so the infant saying, bring on hypothermia, and uh, the established and now uh, Lifetime Achievement Award winner saying, I feel a chill, and 
can't you optimize therapeutic hypothermia to make it effective for everyone? And what about some thoughts? Well, the first thought that comes in beyond the endotyping and phenotyping are, are more rig rigorous protocol-delivered de care. And in Pittsburgh, we certainly are, are very mindful of that, both on the adult and the uh, the pediatric front, and I think one of the most beautiful examples is Cliff Calloway's work. Cliff established a post-cardiac arrest service that goes around to each of the cardiac arrests and, and keeps an eye and tight on the titration of care that's given. And with that kind of approach, you at least have some kind of standardized approach to post-resuscitation care. And um, at U University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, most adults and children who suffer cardiac arrest receive hypothermia, although many of them also uh, receive targeted temperature management. For example, on the adult side, Cliff uses EEG severity right now to try to d determine who will get targeted temperature management versus uh, a more traditional hypothermia. And at least in this arena, you can study it. Uh, and, uh, and, and try to understand it. Well, that might help, but, but come on, why is there such a big advantage for the newborn? So I think that knowledge might provide us some clues as to how to make it more effective in children and even in adults. And uh, many, there have been many hypotheses put forth. Well, I, I mentioned earlier things like, well, there's a much more homogeneous population, and with newborn asphyxia, you, you know, the infant is born, you can get hypothermia on right in front of your eyes right away, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The developing brain, there are all kind of things like that. Uh, you might look, though, at a few other things, and we've been looking to try to understand the developing brain versus the adult brain. And I want to show you a few things that uh, we have kind of stumbled upon that might have some importance. The classic example that everyone always talks about to try to understand why as a developing brain have the potential to be more manipulable is apoptosis. And of course, many neurons are pruned during development. And right around the time of birth, there's still a lot of active pruning of neurons. So it's like you've got more neurons than you need, and the ones that aren't used get silently taken out quietly. And uh, this is done by, of course, caspases. And if you look in the developing brain, you see the amount of caspase 3, the, the primary regulator of the traditional apoptosis pathway, is markedly higher in the newborn brain than as you go to toddler and adult. And this is true in across multiple species. And so maybe that's a potential target. So you'd say, well, let's take a little closer look at the molecular effects of hypothermia in developing neurons versus adult neurons, okay? And uh, this is a slide showing the projects going on right now in the Saffir Center. And uh, the blue are preclinical and the yellow are the clinical studies that are ongoing. And gives you a little idea of what people are working on and I just cheer. And, uh, but I'm only going to talk about the work of one project. And as I mentioned, this is Travis Jackson, who, who walked into Journal Club one day when the targeted temperature management paper was being presented, the adult targeted temperature management, and said, what happens if you take a neuron and clamp it at 36 degrees versus 37? Does it care? Does it know? What does it do? And I just thought it was pretty cool. He asked me, and I said, I don't know. I don't think anyone's ever done that. And, uh, and so he did it. And right around the same time, and I'll show you the findings, and they are published, this paper came out in the journal Nature. And this paper all of a sudden has really shaken the hypothermia field. Uh, it's a really interesting paper. This group took mice with two neurodegenerative diseases, prion infection uh, and like developing mad cow disease and Alzheimer, humanized Alzheimer knock-in mice. And they took these mice and they cooled them down to 16 to 18 degrees. They basically just put them in the refrigerator for an hour and, uh, and then allowed them to spontaneously warm. 
And lo and behold, when they followed these mice over the next year, the neurodegenerative diseases were dramatically attenuated for the life of the animal. And this was a really, really shocking finding. And the, the, the molecular target that they proposed for this and showed with some viral overexpression studies in various brain regions was a protein called RBM3, or RNA binding motif 3. And this is a, a, a heat shock type of protein that is produced in response to cooling that is a master regulator of protein synthesis. And uh, when you think about it, this really differs from the traditional view of hypothermia as a therapy producing potential benefit. It's just a short burst of hypothermia. It's producing some kind of long-term effect. And you can imagine now with chronic traumatic encephalopathy in the NFL and the NHL that some type of intervention that blocks setting into motion chronic neurodegenerative diseases has got a lot of interest right now. And so this is a really kind of surprising finding. And so does this have any relevance to targeted temperature management? Well, if you're interested, this paper we recently published uh, is one which, as I mentioned, takes a look at neurons and just cools them one degree. So our thought about this is, is targeted temperature management really a new concept? Is it ultra-mild hypothermia? We think that it may be. And here is an example. Surprisingly, if you take neurons and clamp them at 24 or 48 hours at either 33 degrees or 36 degrees, and then look a day later, you induce RBM3 in them pretty substantially. And what's really interesting is, keep an eye, this is in day in vitro six neurons. And day in vitro six neurons are basically newborn neurons. They have the synaptic uh, uh, machinery of a newborn neuron. So newborn neurons are doing this. And indeed, when we look, when we rewarm these neurons, protein synthesis is dramatically turned on exactly what you would expect RBM3 to do. And so this whole cascade that is operating in the nature paper seems to be working at ultra-mild hypothermia and then rewarming. And as I mentioned, these days in vitro six neurons are newborn neurons. What about adult neurons? Uh, don't grow old. Uh, it's a real bummer. We took day in vitro six, 26 neurons, which have the more traditional um, receptors and, and, uh, and uh, plasticity type of uh, findings uh, in, in the adult brain. And when we did this, didn't induce it. A minimal induction of RBM3. And wow, might this be one of the mechanisms that a newborn neuron is taking advantage of? Uh, and uh, so we really feel this needs to be examined in a much more careful way. And we're very fortunate. We've just been funded to study this. I think this is being viewed as a, an exciting concept. You might imagine it during deep hypothermic circulatory arrest for open heart surgery going down to 15 or 20, are we inducing this in patients? Could we do a better job inducing it? I mean, these are really key questions, I think. And what about drugs? Is there a way that you could all, uh, either induce this with a drug or add something to hypothermia in the adult brain to make it work better? Uh, this is something that has been asked a lot. And some of the key questions are things like, well, should you target a drug that targets a totally different mechanism of injury than what's being blocked by hypothermia to synergize? Or should you augment what hypothermia is blocking even more with drugs that target the same mechanism because, hey, they're the winners? Uh, and how do you handle the complex effects of hypothermia on drug metabolism? Uh, our group and several others have been kind of leaders in showing, wow, there's a lot of concerns with rewarming during, uh, after hypothermia and impact on changing levels of drugs. How do we get around that? And in fact, if you look at the preclinical literature, a number of the studies, particularly in the adult preclinical models, have shown paradoxical effects of 
drugs canceling out the benefit of hypothermia. So how do we get around this? Uh, there are a lot of challenging questions. And once again, if you look at the preclinical developmental brain injury literature, it seems way more optimistic. Many things seem to work in the developing brain to augment hypothermia. But our idea, since we've stumbled on this new molecular finding, was, well, let's be bold. Let's not take kind of a traditional drug and add it in and see what we can do to augment hypothermia. Can we use this molecular knowledge to really try to come up with some new ideas, not a pedestrian approach? And uh, so we went and looked at a, a, a whole spectrum of various cold shock proteins. When you cool, a variety of cold shock proteins are released. And obviously, some are probably good and some may be bad. And one cold shock protein in our hands seems to have some really powerful effects on these mechanisms. And it's an odd protein called fibroblast growth factor 21. And uh, you can see here, if you take fibroblast growth factor 21, which is a well-known cold shock protein, and you add it to neurons in culture, it induces RBM3. Wow, that's pretty cool. But it only does it, it only does it augmenting ultra-mild hypothermia or, or traditional hypothermia. And uh, so if you slightly cool a neuron and then add fibroblast growth factor 21, it dramatically uh, enhances this mechanism, as you can see there. Might this work in therapeutic hypothermia in a, in a preclinical model or in a patient? Well, you'd say, well, what in the heck is fibroblast growth factor 21? It turns out that there are about 19 uh, other fibroblast, uh, there are 21 fibroblast growth factors. 19 of them are traditional growth factors, but three of them are different, and they are these heat shock type of proteins. And fibroblast growth factor 21 lacks a heparin sulfate proteoglycan domain, and it circulates, unlike a lot of local growth factors in the tissue. And it has an effect only when its receptor is present, and its receptor is either alpha or beta clotho. And this seems very esoteric. How could this have any relevance to targeted temperature management? Well, take a look at this. If you look at where is beta clotho in, in the organism, and you can see that at normal thermia, beta clotho expression is in two places. It's in the liver and it's an adipose tissue. And if you remember your, your pediatrics, the brown fat of the newborn infant uh, is kind of a traditional repository for cold stress uh, action. But you can see if you cool down, beta clotho is expressed in the brain and in the developing brain in particular. And so, wow, this, this gets back to this same story. The newborn brain is different than the adult. And when we take developing neurons and we look at them as we cool them down, beta clotho expression in the developing neurons goes up dramatically. And so this whole cascade is present and it's present more in developing neurons than in adult neurons. So this, in our mind, are the kind of therapies we need to be thinking about preclinically to try to understand hypothermia at another level. Uh, not, let's not just dump a drug in or, uh, or adjust uh, the, uh, a few parameters. Let's really try to understand this. It's really interesting also that fibroblast growth factor 21 crosses the blood-brain barrier. It's transporter systems. And uh, so these kind of str strategies in our mind represent strategies that really deserve to be uh, explored. And so this idea that targeted temperature management is just preventing fever in our mind may not be the case. And that targeted temperature management may really be ultra mild hypothermia. I think it's a really important area to uh, pursue. Uh, so uh, concluding, I, I would say that I think new trial design might help us better define the potential of hypothermia and neuroprotection. I think the age-related differences in these molecular underpinnings of hypothermia really deserve a much more careful look. 
Targeted temperature management may not just be preventing fever, but might have much more powerful effects, as we are calling ultra-mild hypothermia. RBM3 or other RNA binding proteins may represent really novel, potent targets for future drug discovery in critical care. Uh, and fibroblast growth factor 21 and other cold stress proteins may ultimately have the potential to be therapeutic adjuncts. So I think this is a kind of a new exciting time for, for hypothermia. And you could argue and say, well, maybe this could enhance traditional hypothermia or targeted temperature management, or in our mind, ultimately maybe we can even develop a pharmacologic substitute for therapeutic hypothermia. And uh, thinking outside of the box, kind of in a very Peter Safaresque fashion. And um, I'd like to close, though, uh, with, a, with a few quotes that I think uh, have influenced my career and my thinking, and I hope uh, the young investigators and also the mentors out there might, uh, might think about. Uh, a few quotes from the mentors and colleagues who shaped my career. I always mention a number of quotes from Dr. Saffer, but he always said that search for breakthroughs, not p-values, be bold in research. And at the same time, one of my other very important mentors was John Hallenbeck from the National Institute of Neurologic Diseases and also the Naval Medical Research Institute. And he'd always say, do careful science and even small advances may become important building blocks for the future. Brad Peterson, a very influential person in my career who uh, was, uh, is just a tremendous uh, bedside intensivist and did a lot of neurocritical care before it was in vogue uh, back in the, in the 80s. He used to always say, respect the vulnerability of the brain. And the example as a resident there, I, I you know, was a really wanted to get my hands on everything, you know, and he said, you can change this endotracheal tube in this kid with raised ICP if you can do it in five seconds. And, uh, and that, that really, I mean, the vulnerability of the brain is something we know, and uh, I, I, I think it's really important. To, for trainees, I think also, if you're academic, Steve Graham had the best quote, and that was, applying for grants is like voting in Chicago. Vote early and vote often. <laughs> I guess we didn't vote enough. Uh, <laughs> Dick Traitsman, another great mentor of me, uh, just a fabulous guy. When I was given the directorship of the Saffer Center in 1994, he brought me out to Johns Hopkins where he was running his labs. and. He said, this is how you do it. And uh, he, the day started at 6 a.m. and it wasn't in Hawaii. And uh, it ended at like 7 p.m. and that was day one. And it was presentation after presentation after presentation by all of the trainees that he was overseeing. And he used to say, to, to really have an effective group, build a research carousel so that your trainees can jump on and jump off. And I think in critical care, there's nothing more important than that because our lives are so crazy. We're going in and out of the unit and having a stable research carousel, both preclinical and clinical, are really essential. I would say surround yourself with great young people from many disciplines in a department. Give them some rope because they have better ideas than you. Support them, motivate them, be there, let them be bold and cheer. And then Peter Saffer would say, the good things keep coming back. We rediscover them, improve them, and integrate them into contemporary care. And I think you, you see that with hypothermia, which keeps going through these, these evolutionary changes. And we've seen this with fluid management and steroids and things that have effects in our unit, but we just have to figure out exactly how to titrate them, optimize them for the right patients at the right time. And uh, with that, I thank you very much, and uh, I'll be around uh, if anyone wants to discuss any of this or ask any questions. Thank you.